Funding for Curate, the Arizona Arts and Culture Fund is made possible by Signal Society member Eleanor Light and by You Can Become a Curator of the Arts on 8. For more information, call 602-496-8888. And now, an 8th special presentation. This time on Art Beat Nation. A man of the circus reveals how he got his start. If you can see something that can become art, I think it can be appreciated. We meet two explorers who are safeguarding the traditions of tribal Africa. Here is a community that are for many, many, many centuries aware of what, what are the ingredients of human happiness. A chainsaw acts as one artist's instrument of choice. So to me, it is a paintbrush. It's just got a motor stuck to the end of it. And finally, we learn the art of art forgeries. Their forgery careers were really a little bit of a way to get back at the marketplace that overlooked or maybe even didn't appreciate their work. It's all ahead on this edition of Art Beat Nation. Funding for Art Beat Nation is made possible by donations to Curate, the Arizona PBS Arts and Culture Fund, and by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you. In our first segment, we meet artist Jim Siegler. With charcoal in hand, the 84-year-old looks back at a long and undoubtedly magical career designing for the Barnum and Bailey Circus. I'm Jim Sigler. Many years ago, in the 50s, I became associated with Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus. The circus inbred in me the appreciation of color and drama and excitement. The circus has been around for a thousand years or more. It was one of the earlier forms of entertainment for the popular people, just for, for the common people to entertain them. And I think these forward-thinking geniuses of entertainment keep thinking of more exciting and unusual and things that can't happen, but we will do it. I started drawing and wanting to take correspondence courses when I was about eight or nine years old. And then when I got to junior high and high school, I drew myself through history. I'd read it and then I'd go make a picture and showing where we were going and what the costumes were and what people were wearing and I took it in and I made all A's. <laughs> I'll never forget one of my first instructors at Ringland on a landscape class. He would take us to these dirty under the bridges where all these fish scales and skeletons and things were and that would be our class. And he'd say, there's always something beautiful. There's either a beautiful color there, or an unusual mix of colors. There's something that is art. So I think anywhere you look, you can see something that can become art, I think, that can be appreciated. And I think the creative mind just works that way. I don't know how my mind works versus other minds, but all my life I've been fascinated by things, pretty things. All artists, I think, whether they're doing it for the circus or for the theater, for movies or whatever, are doing a painting. Ringland always did three or four what we call spectacles, parades. They would introduce the next era from animal acts to trapeze acts to something else. And we'd come up with ideas. 
based on historical things, based on uh, mythology, uh, you name it. And this, there we go with the costume to make them fit. So that gives you the concept idea of what it should be. And so then we'd come up with a parade and I'd show the type of costumes we wanted. Everything that's happened in my life, I didn't plan. They all were accidental, me being maybe at the right place at the right time. So it was, it was fun. I've had fun all my life. Uh, all 84 years of it. In our next segment, two intrepid explorers share stories and pictures from their adventures in Africa. After all these years, the duo's passion for capturing and safeguarding the traditions they've encountered remains at the heart of their mission. we met in Africa and both Carol and I had been working independently and had done three books before we started our collaboration and when Carol was finishing her first book on the Maasai her father came to the border of Afri to the border of Kenya and Tanzania and decided to give her a birthday present and the birthday present was a hot air balloon flight and the pilot was my brother Simon and they were very young very attractive and at a thousand feet high in the air Simon looked very closely into her eyes and said you know there's something I'd really like to tell you and my heart was beating wildly <laughs> <laughs> and then he said continuing to look very closely in her eye he said I'd really like you to meet my sister my heart sank <laughs> well, we actually met a year later in Nairobi and we realized that Simon was really right we were kindred spirits with a shared love of the traditional cultures of Africa and a passion for the nomadic way of life. And it was during that first week together, photographing at a Maasai warrior ceremony on the border of Tanzania shortly after we met, that we shared a dream. We envisioned that one day we would create a comprehensive visual record of the most powerful ceremonies that move African people through life from birth to death. People don't realize that Africa is 54 countries. It's a very, very big continent. And there's really only one thing that we try to remember, um, although each country is different, is when you go to Africa, you have to leave all your own value systems behind, and you also have to take on African time, which is very different to our time. And what we do when we're in very remote areas is when we first enter a village, we find the village chief and then we usually sit with him, maybe under an acacia tree, and talk with him, get to know him, get introduced to the community, and then <clears throat> we don't take our cameras out. What's really special is that when you're a woman, you're protected by the community. You're not a threat. I mean, historically, the men would be killed or, and the women absorbed so that we always felt that we were surrounded and enveloped and had an advantage being women. We could sit with women and become one of them. And the longer you spent with women, the more they'd want to dress you and you know, put little lines of scarification on your face and tress your hair and give you new names and absorb you into their community and share secrets that no man could access. The challenge was 
when you suddenly wanted to jump off and go and record a male ceremony. You'd become a woman, and it wasn't absolutely acceptable to go running off with a man. And we discovered that one of the little transitional devices was our camera jackets and our trousers. Because the minute we put on our Western clothing, our photography clothing, we were immediately genderless and could go off and photograph with the men. I think in a funny kind of way, once you've lived for 40 years in Africa and you've, you've spent, say, seven months of each year traveling in Africa and our work has led us to now cover 40 countries and probably 170 cultures, you, everything becomes possible, feasible, understandable, but there's still some things that we find very difficult and maybe one of the hardest to watch has been, um, and it, it, it is something that we've only just got permission to do because it's not a, a ritual that people usually allow you to record. It's um, the ritual of scarification and the reason that this is difficult to record is that, that people actually don't want outsiders to see the process of scarification and scarification is one of the oldest forms of beautifying the body like the, the outer body painting. What's remarkable is that a girl may have maybe a hundred cuts made with a small knife or a razor blade creating the pattern and she doesn't flinch and she shows no pain. She's almost got a passive stoic you know, reaction to pain. And what happens is very small cuts are made and then a herbal irritant is rubbed in so that the cut heals with a raised pattern, a, ra a little raised bump, and creates what's considered to be a very beautiful, symmetrical, curvilinear design on her chest. So when you see things that are maybe hard for us to understand, one also realizes that here is a community that are actually for many, many, many centuries, aware of what makes it possible to live in a remote area, what makes it possible to survive, what, what are the ingredients of human happiness. When we completed our last book on painted bodies, we took it back to Africa to share with all those Africans who had helped us make it, and of course to give them copies. And we took it first to the Sahara Desert to show the Wadabe nomad chief, Makao. Macau had seen only two or three books in his entire lifetime. He opened painted bodies and he looked, he went from page to page studying each image meticulously. And at the end of the book, he looked up at us and said in his language, this is Magani Yegitata, which means medicine not to forget. For more, visit carolbeckwith-angelafisher.com. Stand back. Sculptor Mark Rice is wielding a powered chainsaw. But not to worry, it's all in the name of art. Rice uses power tools to sculpt his distinctive wooden statues, and with such finesse, we had to take a closer look. You know, it's running 13,000 RPM. So to me, it is a paintbrush. It's just got a motor stuck to the end of it. It's chainsaw art. I uh, create out of raw material, raw logs, found logs, people's trees, create art you know, with a chainsaw. It's loud, it's fast, it's uh, pretty interesting. I've ran it long enough, I'm not worried about something happening. Other than, oops, you know, it cuts in a little far. Or you have an oops with a chainsaw, it's normally a big oops. But I'm looking at seeing how the grain's running, whether there's knots, there's a whole lot of things you have to incorporate into your process. I can sway the tip, I can do furs, I can do several different textures of furs, sweeps and you know plunge cuts and feathers the same. I can put the veins on the feather, you know, with the saw just by the way it rotates. And my first carbon took me like a wheat, a big, you know, a bigger carbon. And this guy bought it 
And as he's going to the truck, I man, I can't wait to get this pig home. And I was thinking to myself, sticking money in my pocket, that's a bear. <laughs> you know, he bought it for, he, he thought it was the best looking pig. But now they're a lot better. When I started, it was a full size logging saw, you know, 20 inch bar, big tip kicking. And, and I mean, it would kick back bad. You had to worry about it, you know, getting injured. The newer bars, when I got learning, they make them the size of a dime with quarter pitch chains. So it's the size of a dime, it barely kicks. You can do detail. I don't want it to be forced. I want it to just flow. And, and it takes a while to learn that, but once you do, it's uh, crazy what can come off of that saw. This is the remains of uh, the senator from the Big Tree Park after it was burnt, caught fire and fell down, and we recovered it, brought it here to create pieces of art out of it. I was a kid in school, and we'd go field trips to, the, to see the senator. My mom would take us there to see the senator. It's 3,500 years old, there's not another one. So getting to work on it's pretty important. This piece of the senator is over 10 feet tall. It's gonna have two giant uh, horned owls. It'd be pretty neat. I went to Oviedo High School and you know, art training I had was at high school. But I always drew and, and I couldn't get that 3D look. So, you know, it, it just wasn't exciting. And, and chainsaw was exciting. And with a chainsaw moving that fast, that close to you, and there's situations where you're right there where you shouldn't be, but you have to be. With a saw running right by your, your face, it's a, uh, I mean, I've got a few battle scars from the chainsaw. With me, I, I, I got to see it in the wood. All my buddies say they don't see nothing but a piece of wood, but I, I see something that's, the log's shaped a certain way or something that it gives me a starting point. But there's some pieces like this heron right here, I'm tickled with it. If you get up close and look at it, you can see the lily looking floral work in it, the cattails, the dragonfly, and it's all not too detailed. You know, it's, it kind of fits the tree. I finally shut my logging company down and just went doing the art, but then it became a job. But even though it became a job, I've got to do it. You know, I used to run airboats and hog hunt, all this crazy, you know, all this other stuff, and now it seems like I just want to create. I love what I do. And in our final segment, we sit down with art experts at Ohio's Canton Museum of Art. They take a look at the long history and lucrative business of art forgeries. And we learn that there's certainly an art to counterfeiting art. The good news about the counterfeit art market is that it makes up less than 10% of art sales worldwide. The bad news, that's a $6 billion problem. And we look at it like it's a victimless crime, but the truth is they're criminals. And the people who buy these pieces, who are defrauded, are victims. I mean, it's no different than an armed bank robbery, where the bank is the victim and the person doing the robbery is a criminal, or, you know, a, a person, who, a, an individual goes in and, you know, defrauds elders, elder people, and, and steal their money. It's the same thing. Just because it's a sale of a painting that's a fake doesn't mean that it's not a victimless crime. It is a crime. For centuries, copying the work of other painters was a time-honored profession. Apprentices routinely replicated their master's work. It wasn't until the late 20th century, when art prices began to skyrocket, that successful copying took on a whole new meaning. But it was really when the art market started to take off in the 20th century that the value proposition really connected the artist's hand to the piece of art. And that's where really the crime of forgery started to become more prolific. Ironically, most counterfeiters are themselves skilled artists. They possess a great deal of knowledge about the style of the artist they're copying, the era in which the artist worked, and the materials that were used. Some of them were great artists, but what they all have in common is they all were great con men. In several of the cases, these artists have been um, really ignored 
or passed over by critics in the art market. And so their forgery careers were really a little bit of a way to get back at the marketplace that overlooked or maybe even didn't appreciate their work. And so there's a revenge factor, and that's probably the most common motive that you'll see. Sophisticated counterfeiters create backstories about how the works they are selling were discovered. Individual in New York City who was creating uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat fakes. Now, Basquiat was a graffiti artist, lived in the 1980s, uh, or died in the late 80s. There was a movie about him. Uh, he's become very famous, and his artworks are now worth literally millions. Uh, but they're not that hard to reproduce. And what he did was he went out, this individual, and he was able to uh, uh, collect a couple of certificates of authenticity to take a look at them. He borrowed them from friends. And then what he did with the, with the uh, certificates, he recreated those and started using those to go with the paintings and was selling both together. So that was his backstory. It's usually the second tier artists, the, the lesser known artists, though those are the ones that are faked or copied exactly because you may not be as familiar with that collection. But forgeries are really where the market pick kicks in because everybody can claim, I found this in the attic, I found this in the basement, it must be an unknown work Everybody has an idea that what they possess is the famous unknown work by a great master. Everyone thinks that they have that treasure that no one's seen before, and so that perpetuates the problem. To the untrained eye, spotting a fake is hard to do, but there are subtle things to look for to recognize a counterfeit, like the ones in this exhibit. Many times the artists at the time that they were doing these paintings, you know, at the legitimate paintings, they were, they were experimenting. They were doing things a little bit differently. Uh, and, and today, when we do a reproduction, it's a well-known uh, technique. And so therefore, that tentativeness of the, of the experience from the true artist is not going to be there. And many times, uh, forgers, what they'll do is they'll do a great face, they'll do a great figure. But when it comes to those details, they kind of fudge over them because they're just not as good <laughs> as, the, as the artists were. For a more factual analysis, authenticators use modern-day tools to ensure that a painting is an original. Getting it wrong can cost millions. Oh, well, there's, there's plenty of uh, technology today that you use. In fact, more so than the last 10 years. It's a forensic technology. Um, paints are looked at very closely from their, from their chemical compounds. Uh, X-ray, uh, different types of, of uh, radiological technology is used today with X-rays and different other types of uh, radiological technology. Um, you know, and that's how they're discovering these things are not, not correct. If you, if you deem a painting right and it's found to be wrong, or if you deem a painting wrong and it's found to be right, either way, these can be really reputation damaging incidents. And so scholars and art historians are reluctant to give their expert opinion. And in our country, you can be sued for expert opinion. Beyond legal and financial consequences, the infiltration of counterfeit art into the market has an enormous impact on our culture and history. When we insert an authentic works into the art historical record, that historical record is forever damaged. It's forever been corrupted. And so I want people to understand that art forgery really affects our collective cultural heritage as much as it affects people individually from an economic or legal standpoint. It, it assumes a place in the art historical record that it just doesn't deserve. And so in the future, art historians and scholars will be studying that work of art as, it, as if it were authentic. And it really distorts and corrupts the rest of the body of work. For more arts and culture, visit azpbs.org slash artbeat, where you'll find feature videos and information on the Arizona art scene. Funding for Artbeat Nation is made possible by donations to Curate, the Arizona PBS Arts and Culture Fund, and by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you.